Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stop the Chain Reaction um, webinar that's going to speak on how to maintain a great customer experience during 2021 supply chain crisis. Um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Nadav. I'm the VP Growth at, uh, at Rise AI. Very excited to be here and to call in uh, from Tel Aviv with our great partners, um, Carly from Shibab, David from Loop Returns, um, Shosh and Shoshana from uh, No Fraud. Um, thank you all very much for joining. I hope this will be fun and entertaining and also um, filled with new knowledge. Um, and I think that uh, we can start to all um, share my screen. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to post them on, on the questions tab. Um, we will also have polls going on as the webinar progress. Um, let's start. So um, as I said, stop the chain reaction. Um, we will discuss uh, the supply chain crisis and also how us, you guys as brands can really maintain um, and create great customer experiences doing everything that's going on. Um, so just to start with some background, um, you probably needed to be on a very far away place in the last two months if you haven't heard about everything that's going on uh, in the world in terms of, uh, of the supply chains. Um, there, it starts from empty supermarkets. Um, this thing has gone so big on media that we even got to see Joe Biden speaks about it at the World Summit and interviewing about it. It's something that happens everywhere and it's something that's impacting, um, impacting us um, and, and impacts our businesses and something that we have to be aware of and take into account and, and build the strategy with. Um, but before we will go to all the, the great uh, advices uh, that we have today, um, let's start with some background on how really how we really got here um, and, and how this supply chain crisis really did occur. Um, so the supply chain, um, the, the, the first thing that really started the whole thing is that the supply chain didn't really recover from COVID-19. So during COVID-19, we, really we really saw um, uh, a large increase in e-commerce. Um, it was a great time for, for all of us because consumers have moved from buying on physical uh, locations and, and, and moved online. And we all had, all had a lot of great benefit from it. But while that happened, um, harbors and factories and where products are, are manufactured and, and the whole uh, shipping processes were impacted by with shutdowns, um, with um, reducing in labor. Um, and while we kept selling and, and everything seemed to be going really well, there was a big uh, gap um, in, in, in the places where a lot of things happened. Um, while we have COVID-19 as, as, as a causing effect, um, we kept saw uh, an increase in demand. Um, in the last two years, um, the demand, uh, based on, on, on different studies, it seems that the demand has rise as if 50 million more Americans um, were added to the population and people are buying more products. Um, while, as I said, on the harbors and the factories, there are shortages in, 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 in labor um, and in people that can actually do and process um, all, all the actual part of, of, sending, uh, of sending products. Um, the whole uh, crisis, as, as this forecast is today, is expected to last um, up until 2023, which I know it's not, it's not very optimistic and where it hits as today is, and it hit us is that in the most strategic point in the year, um, really just before shopping season. Um, so those are a lot of complex, not the, not the greatest news, um, but we're here to, to see how we can take this opportunity and leverage it and what we can really do. Um, so I introduced, uh, I introduced our panel briefly. We have David Dustin with the big partnerships at Loop. We have uh, Kali at Shibab um, 
who's the senior technology partners and manager, and Shoshana Posner um, from No Fraud, who's the director of business development, and myself. Um, we'll start our topic um, with with Rise and with gift cards, which we which we feel is the missing link in the chain, and what can really help brands um, get past uh, this time and maintain great customer experiences. Um, so in a nutshell about Rise, um, we're really helping retailers and e-commerce brands build meaningful and profitable relationships with their customers with the main tools that are gift cards, store credit, loyalty of programs, um, referrals, and refunds. Um, and now we're really gonna speak about why we think and why gift cards are really, is, is really a great tool um, to keep uh to keep your sales cycle um in a good way so first of all um and this is disregarding from the supply chain crisis um gift cards are the most wanted gift for the holiday season and we've seen it along all the last years so for example if we're talking if we're taking last year um 25 to 30 percent from brands overall from brands that sold gift cards um, so the 25 to 30 percent of their overall sales are are including gift card uh, gift card product, which makes it a leading product um, at a world scale, um, and that's without like um, without regard without the supply chain crisis at all. Um, people are buying more gift cards. It's the easiest and most convenient way to launch. Um, uh, to buy gifts for your loved ones. Um, now, bringing the supply chain into account, um, gift cards is a digital product. Um, digital gift cards can be bought without inventory, without um, shipping process. Um, it's something that can be uh, available at any time. And while we all know um, the buy now, pay later, that tend to be very, uh, very well known at the last uh, at the last few years, um, we see brands now adopt a new tool that says it's called Buy Now and and Shop Later. So now there's no option to to buy certain products, but you can still buy a gift card and assume that in two months, three months, you'll be able to buy um, whatever you want. Um, but this is just gift card as a product. It's just part of the whole story, um, and gift card can be used in a lot of different ways as a tool to increase customer satisfaction and um, and retention. So just as a as a start, um, I think that compensating uh, lack of experience in a lot of time with gift card, it's something that can be great. After this, I'll also show a case study about it. But the concept of saying, listen, I know you really didn't have the best experience, but um, I appreciate you as a customer and here's a gift card um, for your next purchase. Um, and I really want you to, to give me another shot um, um, as a brand. It's something that can really make customers to, uh, to, stay, uh, to stay with the brand for a longer time. It helps to increase, like we really see how it can get um, more sales and really turns those bad experiences into good ones. Um, Another great tool um, that's using gift card or more store credit on that regard is the option to do refunds. Um, refunds with store credit. Um, refund with store credit has really two big benefits. First of all, store credit refunds um, re actively lowering the amount of money that you spend on operation and you spend on returns or refunds or, or, or lost goods. Um, and on the other end, it's also ensuring or much or making the probability for future engagement with your with those customers much much higher so there's two really important benefits um for adopting store credit refunds i i'll, I'll add a disclaimer that this is obviously not uh one solution fits all like if you have a very angry customer or in a lot of use cases it's something that it's not always recommended but when you have customers that you know that are uh that love the brand and, and you know that would would appreciate it you can definitely do it and you can even do more advanced things around it like 
give customers that choose store credit as compensation an addition of 20% um, over 10% um, or 20% over the original order value. Um, another great thing that gift cards can be used um, during this time is to keep your brand top of mind. So first of all, you can actively reach out to customers and convert and create engagement with them with a gift, which is something that's always fun and, and helps make uh, a more appealing and lucrative uh, feel to the brand much rather than discount. Um, and also with, with integrations to things like Apple Wallet, gift card is something that customer really recognize with the brand. And if they keep it close to their, uh, to their wallet in, in this situation, it's something that really helps them to keep your brand top of mind. Um, Walking quickly through um, a case study that we did with Dr. Squatch, it was last year. There was no supply chain crisis, but there was um, but there always delays in shipping. And during holiday season, there's always noise around around the subject. So we did a case study, and they've really adopted the, the, the concept of compensating customers that didn't have the best experience that their shipping was um, out of window was a bit delayed um, as something that as the main tool of them to compensate those customers. And we saw um, that an amount of almost $300,000 was issued um, in store credit. The redemption rate was very, very high. Those customers came back on 30% of the times to buy again. And not only that they were really able to drive this engagement, they have seen um, uh, 2.3 upsell on the amount of credit that was that was given away. So we did could actually make it a profitable, um, a profitable experience. Um, that's our take. Um, and in, in a sec, I'll uh, stop the share screen. But um, just want to say that uh, we're also, in order to cherish this webinar, we're doing a $250 gift card giveaway that can be used either on Brookline and Allbirds, Braggable and Outdoor Voices, and will be given uh, to one of you guys. Um, so that was my part. Thanks everyone for uh, listening. Let's get um, to the questions part. So first one that I have here is, um, do you feel the crisis in Israel? Um, so that's a cool question. Um, and we actually just discussed it prior to the webinar. I'm not the biggest shopper, but I spoke with one of my team members and she quoted that last week when she went to the shopping, she really saw uh, a lot of sizes that were unavailable, which is something that is very uncommon uh, during um, this time of the year. Um, and definitely seems like the thing is here to stay that, um, and that the whole crisis is something that's global and touches a lot of different uh, people around the world. Um, another one that I have here is how can I encourage gift card purchases? Um, so there are a lot of ways, um, and a lot of those best practices are really outlined on, on our website and, uh, in our help docs, but, um, just to point out three that I think can be very meaningful is first of all, promote them, make sure that they appear on your menus, header, footer, make sure to create them nice creatives around it and make sure to wrap it up very well. Um, another very effective, um, solution is to, um, is to put, promote it on social media. Um, there is a Facebook, we have Facebook integration that you can add a buy gift card um, to your Facebook page. You can promote them on stories, on Instagram, on TikTok, wherever your, your audience is. And promoting gift card is something that will definitely um, worthwhile. Um, and the third thing that we see very effective, um, especially at this time of the year, is running promotions on gift cards. Um, first, that I think is great is buy one, get one. Uh, if you bought $100 gift card for your friend, you get $20 gift card for yourself to really encourage um, a future uh, a future action, a future engagement. Um, and that happens to really prove itself very well. And it's very easy to market because you practically get some value from the same product that you actually buy. Um, and another option, um, which is also great, is to do discounted gift cards, um, promote gift cards, say like purchase this gift card for $90, but get the gift card uh, that its value is $100. Uh, so those things, I think, can really encourage um, gift card purchases. And there's a lot more. Um, so 
thank you everyone for listening. Um, and uh, now I want to introduce Carly um, at uh, Shipa that uh, we'll discuss uh, that we'll discuss about uh, everything that they, and how Shipa helps um, brands handle the supply chain crisis. Carly, you're on mute still. Rookie move, rookie move. Um, awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen ev with everyone. Give me one second here. There we go. Awesome. Um, so thanks so much for teeing that up. My name is Carly Doddell, and I am the Senior Technology Partnerships Manager at ShipBob. Um, so if you're not giving holiday, if you're not giving gift cards this holiday season, you are probably shipping something. So I'm going to be talking about how you can optimize your Q4 logistics using distributed inventory. So I want to cover the basics and give everyone a high level overview of ShipBob. So ShipBob is a global logistics platform that fulfills e-commerce orders for direct to, to direct to consumer brands. We have 30 global fulfillment centers. We offer custom packaging, gift notes, and inserts. For our customers, we are a carbon neutral fulfillment company. And then we have 100% coverage for two-day delivery across the US. And we have 30 direct integrations with one of my integration partners on the call, uh, David Dustin from Loop Returns. And then we have warehouses in US, Canada, Ireland, London, Australia, and then our newest one, which is Poland. So how does this all work? So how it works with ShipBob is we integrate with all the major e-commerce platforms. So think Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, ShipStation, Amazon, eBay, pretty much all the major ones. And so let's use Shopify, for example. So how an e-commerce brand uses us is they directly integrate their Shopify store to the ShipBob dashboard. They send their physical products to our fulfillment centers. And then as orders are placed on their site, we pull that into the ShipBob dashboard and then we begin to pick, pack and ship it out as well as push tracking back to the end platform. So really we are trying to be the Amazon for e-commerce brands. So what we're really gonna focus on today is distributed inventory, which is the operational strategy of splitting inventory across multiple fulfillment centers to get products to the customer faster and more affordably, especially during Q4. So a lot of times I hear from e-commerce brands, you know, splitting my inventory seems really scary. I'm gonna have to work with more than one fulfillment center. You know, I it, it seems like it's gonna cause more harm than it is good, which is actually not the case. When looking for a 3PL, you really wanna find one that has multiple locations like ShipBob. Um, that way you have one central dashboard even if you have, you know, seven warehouses, you have one dashboard where you can see all of your inventory. I think another big thing to realize is you want your inventory by your, your customers, right? And typically your customers are not in one central place. They're spread out across the entire world. So really you want to have your inventory close to your end customer. That way the order is getting to them faster and more affordably. So, I think a lot of times, you know, people think, okay, distributing in inventory in the US. Yes, that is true. But international is a huge win as well. Um, distributing your inventory internationally helps you reduce carrier costs and transit times, right? So instead of having to ship from the US to Australia, you can actually have stock within Australia. And then of course, it prevents custom fees and import taxes, which no one likes those. Um, it reduces cart abandonment. We see this a lot with merchants that, you know, are, you know, offering international shipping, but their shipping times to get to Australia are 14 plus days. So a lot of times a customer, you know, might need something sooner and that 14 day shipping window just does not work for them. And then it enables expansion with lower costs and less operational complexities. So if you are an e-commerce brand and you are shipping internationally, I really encourage you to think about also having inventory internationally as well. 
So faster, reliable shipping. Thanks to distributed inventory, merchants can use ground shipping services to offer two-day delivery for less money than expedited shipping. I think this is huge. Um, so instead of having, you know, one fulfillment center and having a two-day option that, you know, needs air shipping, which is a premium service and typically comes with a premium price tag, you're actually able to distribute your inventory, achieve two-day shipping by using ground services. So it really makes that two-day option a cost-affordable option that your merchants can choose. And then how it works with ShipUp is we partner with all the major carriers, UPS, DHL, FedEx, and some, some local carriers as well. And so what we do is anytime an order is placed on an e-commerce brand site, we then look, okay, what is the carrier that's going to get it there the fastest and what carrier is going to get it there the most cost affordable? And then we ship it out via that carrier. And there's nothing that the brand needs to do on their end. We do that all in the back end for them. So I know I've talked a lot about, you know, distributing your inventory and kind of alluded to the goal of distributing your inventory is to achieve two day shipping. And I just want to talk about why two day is so important. And so I'm going to start with this stat. 67% of shoppers expect two day delivery. I know at least I do. Amazon has really just ingrained it in my head that I should get everything in two to three days. Um, so two-day delivery really encourages repeat purchases by meeting expectations with fast and on-time delivery. It converts more customers by offering two-day shipping to reduce cart abandonment. Um, for me, at least, I procrastinate. And so oftentimes I am definitely in a pinch and I need something in two days. So if I'm on a brand's website and I see one, they don't have, you know, two day as an option, I oftentimes have to, you know, look at another product or even worse, go to a competitor, competitor of that brand. Um, and then, of course, it entices shoppers to spend more to unlock free two day shipping by using sp spend thresholds greater than your current AOV. So this is something we see a lot of our brands doing by saying, you know, spend $200 and unlock free two-day shipping. And at least for me, from a customer standpoint, I will always spend that, you know, spend threshold to get it in two days. So single source of truth. So I don't think you can talk about, you know, distributing your inventory and achieving two-day without talking about uh, the WMS, which is a warehouse management system. So with ShipUp, essentially what that is, it's the ShipUp dashboard. And with the ShipUp dashboard, it gives you real-time global fulfillment visibility. So really what that means is it gives you insight into your stock levels at every one of our fulfillment centers. So whether you have, you know, five in the U.S., and three international locations, it's all in one dashboard for you. And you can toggle through those fulfillment centers and see exactly how much stock you have in those fulfillment centers. And then I think it's gonna be, it, well, it's really important that your WMS connects to your entire tech stack, right? Making sure it integrates with your e-commerce platform, like your Shopify, your Big Commerce, or your WooCommerce making sure that it integrates with your customer support tools, making sure it integrates with your returns provider like Loop, and making sure everything really speaks to each other so you have this cohesive flow. And then one thing I want to highlight is the unboxing experience. I think a lot of times a misconception is, you know, hey, if I have multiple fulfillment centers, my unboxing experience might suffer, which is actually not true. If you have an unboxing experience with ShipUp, how our LA fulfillment center ships it out is it's, it is going to be exactly the same as how our Chicago fulfillment center ships it out. So, and then we just really highlight that, you know, unboxing is huge, especially post holiday. It really builds that loyalty and that retention of a customer. Um, and we allow our merchants to have gift notes and loyalty focus inserts. We allow them to have, you know, branded boxing, branded poly mailers, stickers, and tissues. And then we do have a partnership with a company called Pashama that helps offset shipping admissions. And then a stat I always like to point out as well is 40% of shoppers 
will share a product image on social if it comes in a branding packaging. So we definitely know how important it is to be able to offer that unboxing experience. And just because you have multiple fulfillment centers does not mean that that needs to suffer. So a success story that I always like to highlight is um, one of our customers, TV12. Uh, they've been with us for a couple holiday seasons now, and they use about, I want to say, four of our fulfillment centers to achieve two-day shipping and get those, you know, really good rates without having to use premium air services. Um, and essentially in this quote, they just say how they've been with ShipBob for a couple holiday seasons now and that their old 3PL would definitely not have been able to keep up with the demand um, of their order volume when it increases during the holiday season. And then some holiday fulfillment tips that I wanna leave you guys all with today is make sure to secure a 3PL Forecast demand, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday is coming up. Make sure you have enough stock for that. Um, make sure you have those shipping options. Make sure you're offering free shipping and have cost affordable two day shipping options. Distribute your inventory to achieve those shipping options. Make sure you're confident in your WM WMS and make sure you are having an unboxing experience to drive customer loyalty and build brand awareness. And then a special offer I want to highlight for everyone is ShipBob is offering $1,000 in free shipping credits. And if you want to apply to see if you qualify, you just need to go to ShipBob.com slash Rise AI. And you can just fill out that form and see if you qualify for that $1,000 in free shipping credits. And then I'm going to leave you guys all with my email. If you have any questions or just want to talk about fulfillment or anything like that, please feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, I will go and answer some questions now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Cool. Thank you so much, Carly. I think it's been really interesting and eye-opening presentation. And you can see it based on the, the audience reaction. So let's start um, from the first, um, um, which was now me. How many warehouses do you need to efficiently deliver two days across the U.S.? So it really depends on your product. I mean, with ShipBob, essentially what we can do is we can ask for at least, you know, three to six months of your historical shipping data with zip codes. And then we can tell you exactly which fulfillment centers you need to put your inventory in to achieve two day shipping. Because, of course, it's going to be different from a swimsuit brand to maybe a skincare brand. You know, swimsuits going to be really you're going to be shipping a lot of orders to those warmer climates like the West Coast and in Florida. So today really looks different for a lot, but typically you need at least four fulfillment centers to achieve it. Cool. Um, moving forward to Edwin, does ShipBob, it's been relevant for us here in Israel, does ShipBob have plans to for a warehouse in Asia? Um, I don't know if that is on the roadmap yet. We are definitely going to be expanding internationally. Um, our newest one that we just opened up about a couple weeks ago is Poland. And then not quite sure what other ones are on our roadmap right now. Cool. So TBD on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure to get back to Edwin. Um, Stephanie is asking, is ShipUp actively taking on new customers or do you have capacity? No. So that is the great thing about ShipBob and our turnkey integrations with the e-commerce platforms is we mm -hmm. will onboard merchants the entire holiday season. We don't have any cutoffs or any end dates. We can continue to onboard merchants throughout the holiday season. That's amazing. So yeah. Good news for you, Stephanie. <laughs> um, and for, for everyone. Um, next to Jennifer, does ShipBob work with food producers? So we don't, but Jennifer, if you want to contact me, we do have some um, partners that work with suppliers that could probably help you out more than I can. Great. Um, Stephanie is, with Carrie's experiencing processing delays, have you noticed a drop in no time delivery with two days delivery options recently? Yeah, so the great thing about ShipBob is we really monitor that. And if we see, you know, UPS or FedEx falling behind on getting orders in two days, we will route everything to another carrier. That way our merchants are not experiencing that lag of, you know, not getting orders in two days. 
Makes sense. Um, so this one is long by Andrew, but um, I'll try to read it slow uh, and with confidence. If inventory is divided up across multiple fulfillment locations, that is require more inventory to have um, adequate levels, which might be complicated with supply chain issues. And how does inventory get redistributed to different fulfillment centers? Okay, Andrew, I'm going to take a stab at your question. Yes, <laughs> if you are dividing your inventory, um, you are going to want to have a little bit more inventory than typically. But at the same time, like it doesn't, you really just want to forecast and demand for your orders. And then when it comes to distributing your inventory, like I said, we can tell you and make recommendations for you. And then you can send all of your inventory to one central ship -ob facility. Um, if it's easier for you to ship to LA because of the Long Beach ports, or maybe you wanna ship to Chicago, Illinois, because it's just super central in the US, we can then distribute your inventory for you. Sounds, sounds great to me. At least, Andrew, I'm hopeful that, that it's satisfying. If that does not suffice, let me know. I will share my email in the chat and just ping me, and I, we can set up a call and chat further. Great. Um, just referencing that Andrew is our gift card winner for today. Um, also, so he is uh, lucky twice. Um, Joanna, um, and that will be the last question before we progress to David. With Shebob, can I use my own shipping account? Um, you can't. So typically, we'll, we will get um, better negotiated rates than a lot of people that want to use their own shipping account. We have 4,000 plus merchants all shipping from our account. So we get heavily negotiated rates for the carrier. So it is a requirement right now to use our shipping account. Um, cool. And just one that I didn't know this. So we'll have another one from Thomas. Do you have food grade facilities or product is a meat snack? No refrigeration necessary tanks it said it does need refrigeration is that correct um no it said that it does not require refrigeration oh yes so shipob can handle um any shelf stable food um and then we do have climate controlled fulfillment centers um that will probably be best for your product. So feel free to reach out to me after um, and we can discuss further, but I will hand it over to, I believe, David now. Yes, so David can unmute yourself and welcome yourself to the stage um, and share your screen, David from VIP Partnerships at Loop Returns. So still is on mute. <laughs> Okay. Thank twice. you, Unidab and Carly. And let's see, are you seeing my screen right now? Mm, not you yet. Should be there. Let's see. Not yet. Um, the show button is internally at the bottom. You know what? I, I did that, but it's giving me a note that I must authorize screen sharing. Okay, so we'll do it um, from our end to keep the flow. Um, I'll share yeah. screen from my end. Perfect. All right, fantastic. And thank you so much. And I love this discussion. And I'm talking to lots of merchants right now who are telling me they have products stuck in LA. Um, some merchants who are saying that they are going to be out of quite a few of their items this fall. And uh, it really, really drives on the point that we that in this kind of environment uh, that you can't win on just volume alone. And the way to win at this moment is to be more profitable in the items that you do have available and to deliver experience that is going to bring your customers back again and again. And one question is, so how do you do that? Uh, a part of that answer is to drive up your... Um, return on ad spent. And in order to do that, uh, one huge opportunity is that 60% of customers are visiting your return policy prior to purchase. And so there's a huge opportunity to increase your uh, conversion rate by driving merchants into that process. Uh, returns can have a huge impact there. And 
you need a strategy that gives customers the confidence they need to purchase, gets their inventory back faster, and turns more of their inventory into saved cells. And turning those returns into exchanges can be a, a big blind spot for brands. One way to do that is by making exchanges easy. And uh, so the way to do that is number one, to start your return process by searching for the order number or zip code, change the address of the associated order, and then select the new item without having to process a refund first. Uh, by doing this, you'll experience fewer returns to reduce the amount of time support reps have to deal with exchanges and generally create an easy experience for customers. Another option, uh, which is something that, you know, merchants do all the time to drive sales uh, in the beginning is to uh, get rid of the shipping fee. What merchants don't generally know is that you can use that as a carrot to actually increase the exchange rate over returns. And it's a huge, huge opportunity. Uh, next, if you go to the next slide, so let, let you know kind of how Loop has become the expert in this process is that we are really purpose built for Shopify. And if you'll go to the next slide, Nadav, uh, Loop was born out of an agency that was run by our founder, Jonathan Poma. And he was running an agency called Rocket Code. His customers were Chubby, Allbirds, Cotopaxi. And they were coming to him and saying, hey, we're getting slammed by returns. We need solutions that can help us to solve this. And uh, the first thing they came to and said, hey, we just need an automated platform for them to be able to easily do a return. And then the next request was, hey, we need the, the ability to be able to do an exchange to a different item or a different color. And after that was the request, hey, we need our customers to be able to actually shop our whole category or a whole catalog as part of the returns process. And uh, as the solution was developed, uh, it made a massive, massive impact for brands because number one, these customers that are doing exchange, a lot of times for a merchant, that might be 20, 25, 30% of a brand's volume. And when you're able to take the return rate the, or the exchange rate, which might be 15 or 20% and drive that to 40%, the number one most meaningful part of that is that your customers are getting a better experience. These people that you're going out and doing ad spend on are getting a better experience. They're ending up with a product they love and you're driving up the lifetime value. You're reducing the time to the next sell and it ends up being a huge, huge win. And so if you'll go to the next uh, slide, Nadev, uh, this is what the process ends up looking like to really uh, take your returns and uh, turn them into part of your business that can actually drive new business. So first of all, the ability to easily do a return with order number and zip code, the ability to exchange for a different size and a different color. And then last, uh, the ability to actually shop your catalog within the exchange experience and exchange for a new item. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as Carly mentioned, we integrate with ShipBob. We also integrate with Rise. We have 30 integrations uh, into other places like Clavio and Gorgeous and all across the ecosystem, whether it is shipping companies, 3PLs. And so across the board, uh, we're able to uh, make it a seamless part of your experience and take something that a lot of people view as a cost center and turn it into a place where you look to drive up your exchange rate and even increase your revenue per sell. And so that's that's the opportunity that Loop has to help you kind of stop that chain reaction and capitalize more on the sales that you are getting. So uh, let's see, Nadav, should we go to the questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're on our way. Um, great. So first of all, thank you, David, um, for giving some more context on, on Loop. Um, Let's start with um, how can merchants incentivize their customers to exchange instead instead of return an item? You know, one offer one option that we have, uh, along with potentially offering free shipping on an exchange, which is uh, you know a big win. If the if the customer does a return, then they end up actually paying for the return the the shipping. If they do an exchange, uh, the merchant pays for it, and that's a great incentive. We also give the option for customers to actually give the customer more money to shop with if they do an exchange. So they can offer five, 10, $15 and say shop with this amount now or do a return. 
And uh, we've seen you know, a lot of case studies where people will have their exchange rate climb from 25 to 35 or 35 to 45% based on offering an incentive for that. So can you, and just out of curiosity, like today, what's the kind of stat between customers that choose to exchange or to return? Yeah, so, I mean, it depends on the category you're in. For most mm -hmm. merchants, the average return rate is about 20%. And the average exchange rate out of that 20% is only about 20% of those that turn into exchange. With Loop, merchants drive 40, 45% of their returns into exchanges. That's amazing. Um, cool, thanks. Um, so another one from the audience. With all the supply chain uncertainty merchants are facing, what can brands do to increase their profitability on the, um, the items they do have available? Yeah, the biggest answer there is delivering a great experience to the people who are buying your products. And, uh, you know, there's, there's different approaches to this, but ultimately making it easy for them to do an exchange, making it easy for them to do a return. And uh, that, that's a huge, huge win. It's going to increase your lifetime value. And at the end of the day, if that lifetime value is high, it's all going to work out. Amazing. Cool. I think that's been really important, interesting um, for me, um, at least, and I hope for everyone. Um, so thank you very much, David. And now to our last but not least speaker, um, Shoshana at No Fraud. Shoshana, how are you? I'm good. I'm trying good. to unmute my speaker before. Did I do well? <laughs> Certainly. Are you ready to take the stage and share a screen? Yeah. Cool. So the stage is yours. There we go. Do you see my screen? Ooh. Mm -hmm. There we go. So you can... Okay. So uh, Shoshana here from No Fraud. I have been with the company for over five years, working in um, business development for the most part. Um, no Fraud provides accurate real-time fraud screening for online businesses. And today I'm here to provide a different perspective on how to keep customers happy during the supply chain crisis. So a quick one-on-one -on, -one on who is No Fraud. Um, no Fraud provides um, fraud prevention for online businesses. We are based in New York City in the Freedom Tower. Please stop by, it's an amazing view on the 76th floor. Uh, we're trusted by over 3,000 brands and 150 plus countries, and we have um, a 97% plus known transaction network, meaning that we have identified transactions in almost in almost every case, and we, we've seen this customer beforehand. Um, so it helps us link orders together to identify authenticity. We have five-star ratings in the big commerce and G2 app stores and 4.9, which is the highest rated app um, in the Shopify app store with over um, 100 reviews. Uh, we've got, we work with companies of all different sizes. Here's a nice little um, <laughs> array of businesses that we work with. Now, due to the supply chain issues that the world has been experiencing, purchase patterns are changing. Uh, shoppers who can't get the products at stores that they normally frequent are going to be scouring the web, looking everywhere to find their product, and they will hopefully land on your site. It's important to remember that these shoppers may not look or seem familiar or traditional traffic compared to what you're used to. Um, firstly, they are typically not browsers. They know what they want. They know the color they want it in. They know the features. They'll find it. They see it. They'll, they want to buy it. Um, they may be coming from other countries. The, um, you know, supply chain, the, the supply chain crisis is not a U.S. issue alone. So you may get cut shoppers from other countries coming um, to your site. And a lot of companies aren't currently set up to ship internationally. So they may be shipping to freight forwarders um, to circumvent the, the shipping issue. So there is a golden opportunity here to gain new customers, ones that normally wouldn't shop on your site. Um, and it's crucial that your current fraud prevention method tactics, uh, fraud prevention tactics or methods don't prevent these new potential customers from buying from you. So what type of things are you doing can, or are you possibly doing now that could prevent new customer acquisition? 
So the first thing that many companies do is they don't ship to freight forwarders. So what is a freight forwarder? A freight forwarder is essentially also known as a reshipper. Um, when you Google the address, it normally looks like a warehouse or a storefront. Um, and what it really does is it accepts packages, slaps on a label, and ships the product elsewhere. Um, this has, as, as you could imagine, um, if you're a fraudster working out of Nigeria and you want, you, know, you got a, a bunch of cards fresh off of the dark web, you're not going to ship the product directly to Nigeria and you're not obviously going to um, show your IP that you're from Nigeria. So what you'll probably do is you'll probably mask your IP and ship the product to a freight forwarder in New Jersey or in Florida, um, there's you know countries on the on the edge of the United States, sorry states on the edge of, of the country are usually where freight forwarders are located. Um, so there's a high use of of um, th there's a, a lot lot fraudsters very frequently use freight forwarders. Now along with fraudsters, for the most part, um, legitimate customers and shoppers, usually international customers, use freight forwarders as well. Um, for example, you sell an amazing streetwear brand and you have um, a great social media presence. Someone in Spain saw your products like, wow, I love it. Uh, I want to buy it, um, but you don't ship to Spain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ship to a freight forwarder and I'm going to and that freight forwarder will ship the product um, to Spain. So it will be, you know, it will have a U.S. shipping address. So some companies have been burned so badly by freight forwarders that they'll say, no, I'm blocking the zip code. I'm blocking this freight forwarder, et cetera. So with the advent of, you know, or the expected um, increase in new shoppers, specifically international shoppers, that's a tactic that you don't want to do. Yes, it can prevent fraud, but it, you're definitely holding back some good orders by having um, such a restriction. The second thing is restrictive gateway filters. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, many payment gateways out the gate already have these filters in place. They, the processors think that they're doing you a favor by making sure the transactions are safe from fraud. And what they will what they will do is they'll they'll essentially put in rules at the gateway that say things like if the billing address isn't what the credit card company has on file, then you know you wouldn't want to take the order. Or you know it has to at least be a zip code match. Um, you know people should know what their what their billing address is, and if not, they're for sure fraudsters. So um, this is having restrictive gateway filters is a big sales killer. Firstly, um, it doesn't. You know, maybe back in the day it used to help fraud somewhat, but there's so much data sloshing around the dark web that most of the cards come with associated billing address. So it's not even an effective way to prevent fraud, um, but it does prevent good orders um, because many, you know, many people move, they put in the wrong billing address. Um, so, uh, so that's a very common um, thing that happens. Also, international banks do not have ABS, which is what the, what those rules are. They're, they're called ABS rules. So if you have an international shop or their card doesn't support ABS, the, the ABS code will be a U or a G. Um, these gateway filters may be blocking them and you won't even have a chance to look at the order because the order will be blocked at the gateway. So that those are two diff different things that companies do that they don't even realize are holding back um, good orders, all in, the, in, in a good in a good name, right? You want to prevent fraud, but it does hold back good orders. So, what can you do to ensure your business is safe from fraud, but you also provide a good customer experience for these expected new customers? And of course, you're even getting to the point where they can check out. So, in short, you have to look at other risk factors aside from one-dimensional fraud rules. So, those two things I told you before are one-dimensional. If the shipping address is a freight forwarder, don't want to take the order. But you, there are ways to look at the other pieces of data on the order and say, yes, it, there is a high risk of fraud because it's a freight forwarder, but look what else I see on the order that allows me to safely ship to this order. So for example, let's use um, that example of um, a streetwear company that is uh, has a, a, a customer from Spain. So in that case, um, a legitimate shopper will use their IP. They have nothing to hide. So you'll see the IP addresses from Spain. You may see that the name um, on the address, you know, no, the, the name sounds um, Spanish. The bin that is used on the card, the bin is the first six digits, that provides you the bank that issued the card. And you can do a quick Google search, put that bin in, you know, bin 84621, um, and you'll see that it was issued in Spain. Um, the email address would, you know, has longevity, it's been around. Um, fraudsters typically don't use their own email addresses. 
that's what a safe use of a freight forwarder looks like. So if you put a little bit of effort into these orders, you'll be able to safely ship a lot more orders, especially from these brand new customers. Another example is that the customer, let's say, put in the wrong billing address, right? So you know, look at other factors, email longevity, um, phone number, is it a Google burner number? Can you call the customer? It, um, you can even Google it. You'll often find the phone number linked to the person's name. Um, sometimes you can link the name to the shipping address by property records. So with a little bit of investigation, you can often be able to validate these high, seemingly high risk orders and allow you to ship um, more products this season. Um, now, many, okay. um, so many customer service teams are already stretched in during holiday season. There's an increase of where's my order. Um, you know, people have questions about returns and exchanges and things like that. So transaction review, specifically the human analysis element, is something that's easily outsourced. Um, thousands of companies already realize the advantage to outsourcing fraud um, to experts who have access to more data. And I mentioned that 97% um, known order network. We've seen customers before. We can see patterns. You know, we know, yes, this person always puts in the wrong email address. It's fine. They've done it 17 times with you know, 12 of our customers. This order safe to ship. We don't even need to look at it. So, you know, there's an automated decision. Um, and the benefit to outsourcing is threefold. Um, firstly, you can accept a, high, a, a lot more high-risk orders. Second, you eliminate all, all manual review. Everything is outsourced to no fraud. Um, and it gives your customer service team a lot more time to do what they do best, which is take care of customers and not try to figure out who the fraudsters are. Um, and thirdly is eliminate chargebacks. Um, you don't need to have to worry about chargebacks when you have no fraud helping you with fraud. If you do get a chargeback, and I'd love to say it never happens, it does, um, you, know, you, you would get reimbursed and you would get your money back from no fraud. Um, no fraud's been doing this for years, partnering with e-commerce brands like Burton Snowboard, Super 73, Pat McGrath, 310 Nutrition on pretty much every platform that exists. So we're happy to lend a hand uh, during busy season. Um, we have capacity, so if uh, something that's been stressing you out, we're happy to help. Um, oh, here we go. Um, another opinion on outsourcing, um, Nick Thompson is the Director of, of Operations at Monoprice. So this is what he wrote once he implemented no fraud. Um, now that fraud detection is automated, season, seasonal and holiday spikes don't create any delays. Every year, the monoprice team used to encounter backlogs and delays. That's simply not the case now that they have no fraud. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, and if you <laughs> look at this picture, um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these in the uh, scary articles that talk about the, the shipping nightmares that are happening. You know, some of these packages belong to you. You've shipped out some of these. Um, and customers that don't get their items, sometimes instead of calling you and saying, hey, you know, I, I didn't get my item, can you ship me a new one? They'll submit a chargeback saying item not received. So due to the increasing demand um, for help with item not received, chargebacks, no fraud actually can uh, provide coverage as far as charger protection on those types of, of transactions um, or those types of chargebacks as well. So if that is something that you need help with, um, please do reach out. Um, we'd be happy to help, and you can uh, grab my email address over there, Shoshana at uh, I'd be happy to ha set up a, a discussion. Great. Thank you, Shoshana. It's been really, really interesting. We got some questions from the audience. So we'll start with Naomi. Um, what are the highest fraud items? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I love this question also because you know, sometimes I get, I'm, I'm fascinated by watching the things that people try to steal. I mean, a $15 lipstick, yep, people try to steal that. You would think it's only, you know, Nike sneakers and, you know, Nest cameras. Those are definitely high fraud items. Um, but if you, if you have a product that is valuable and has a great resale value, it's going to be a target, um, you know, at some time or, or later. Um, the, the most popular products that are stolen are ones that, typically have a high value in a, in a physically small item. So, you know, for example, like a gold coin has, is expensive, but it's it's small. Like a sofa, I guess there's tons of fraud in, 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 um, in furniture as well, but it's a lot harder to resell. Um, and these schemes are, are much more complex. Like they usually involve Airbnbs and things like that. But a, a very easy, you know, first time fraudster can, will usually target things that are, are easily resellable and have a lot of value in a physically small item. So like electronics, coins, um things like that no makes makes total sense um 
Well, Celeste, um, is it better not to accept orders with high fraud alert, let's say from Shopify, for instance? So that's a great question, um, and that comes up quite frequently. So we did an analysis on Shopify's um, fraud products, um, and uh, in about, uh, I believe it was a third of the time, the high-risk orders from Shopify are actually not fraudulent. So you got to be careful with those. They're, they're accurate very frequently, and the, they're, the Shopify's native product is good at detecting the obvious fraudsters. We're talking the first time fraudster that you know, that said, I'm changing my career, and they do everything wrong, easily identifiable, Shopify will pick that up. But anything that's a little bit more sophisticated, things like triangulation fraud, um, or, or fraud that involves identity theft with multi, like you know, getting um, fraud mules to issue cards, they're not going to pick up on that at all. Um, so it depends on what you're experiencing. And what we love to do is to do an audit on running our system against Shopify's. And what we've found in almost all cases is that Shopify's way too restrictive and they miss fraud. So that you, you end up hurting on both ends. Um, and what we're able to do with an audit is run both systems in tandem and then show you the differences and the, the more orders that we're able to accept and the fraud that, that Shopify missed. That's a great question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Silis, and thank you, Shana, for the detailed answer. Um, two more to go. Uh, Naomi, what information should we collect from suspected fraudulent orders to make it easier to help with the review process? So there's um, clues in every little bit of data that you see, and it, it's pretty fascinating. Um, you know, let's go. Th I'll go through a couple of examples. Um, expedited shipping. I know it's kind of a joke because there's no shipping that's expedited almost anymore. Um, but yeah, that is common. You know, you're hoping to get the fraudsters hoping to get the product before. You know, we're like, whoops. Um, you know, th this is fraud. So that's a very common one. Um, looking at the quality of the email, even just like somebody eyeballing it can look and say if it's xzy2247 at gmail.com probably not the greatest quality email. Yes, it's easy to computer generate ones that look a little better, um, but there, there's a method to the madness and there, there are tools that'll tell you data on an email um, to, to be able to kind of dig, or, dig deeper and, and provide some information on that. Um, you know, phone number, you can even call, like who answers at the other end of the line? Does it, is it a Google burner number? Is it a cell phone belonging to the, to the person that made the order? Um, that gives you a lot of data. Um, you know, shipping to a freight forwarder, and we spoke about that a lot. Definitely an increase in in, in fraud on that, but again, does not necessarily mean it's fraud. Um, sometimes you can do something interesting if you sell a high product, a high fraud item. Um, look at the home value. Like, you know, if you're doing it on your own, you can just eyeball it um, and do some Google search. But it's one of the things that we look at. Um, we had a, a fraud ring a month or uh, a, a while ago where. The, I mean, it was very sophisticated. The billing address matched, everything matched up. The only indicator was that these were expensive items going to trailer parks and something just doesn't seem right when the, the trailer home worth $20,000 and it's two laptops each worth 3,000. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, it was really difficult to uncover. But again, those are things that you can look at to see, you know, it, does this order make sense or, or you know, is it fraudulent? Yeah. Just it seems that it just needs to be top of mind and that's all a big part of the issue. Um, Courtney, last question. Have you already seen an increase in chargebacks with the supply chain demands even prior to Cyber Monday? Yes, um, consumers are impatient. And as Carly said, you know, everyone's competing against Amazon. Everyone wants the Amazon-like experience. Um, you know, my order is five seconds late. I want a refund. Um, so it's not... Um, it, it, unfortunately, a lot of consumers manipulate the chargeback process and, you know, the merchants are the one footing the bill. So um, we've seen quite a bit of that already. Cool. The crowd keeps on engaging. So we have two more for, for last. Sabrina, when should a company decide to implement a fraud prevention solution or strategy? So when the pain is, is great. Um, and what is pain? Um, pain is, could be well, with this line item on our balance sheet, we lost how much to fraud? That's one of them. Um, secondly is my customer service team is working around the clock. They can't handle all, the, all this fraud or the pressure is too great because they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. I'm like, how am I supposed to know if this is fraud? What do I know? You know, I don't have the right tools. So there's a lot of stress that we see on, on a customer service team. So when those complaints start bubbling up, um, then that could be time. Um, another option is 
when um, you're getting too many customer service complaints about canceled orders. That means that you, you're you being too overzealous in your fraud prevention tactics. Rather, you know, you're trying to make sure you don't have any fraud, but you're blocking a bunch of orders. So when those start bubbling up, um, you know, that also is means that it's that it's time. Uh, and most companies, once as they grow, and there's so many big, you know, fast growing e-commerce brands on this call, um, you know, you, you, you as a company grows, there, there's usually very obvious signs that it's time to outsource. Cool, great. Um, so I'm just skipping the question because, uh, and I think that answered Andrew question, Andrew's question um, as well. And we're pretty much good to. Um, to wrap things up. So first of all, um, I'd love to say uh, big thanks for everyone who has participated. Carly, David, um, uh, and Shoshana, it's been really, really interesting and great doing it uh, with you guys. Um, second thing I want to give to, to our team at RISE for being able to pull this webinar um, quickly, efficiently, um, and what we think is, uh, is the highest level. I know we, we all, I, I couldn't do it without you and, and you've been uh, great. Um, and lastly, for you guys for attending, um, it seems that it worked well because almost we, we kept a very uh, um, the same level of, of, of audience along the entire presentation. So it seems like it was interesting, um, which is great. And I hope you, you enjoyed. Um, so yes, thanks everyone. Um, and uh, have a good day in the States, evening here in Israel. Um, and bye-bye.